Welcome back to Signal Ditch. As always, I'm Nick, and today we're going to talk about the lathe. In a previous video about my open source glass blowing lathe, we talked about the design, discussed some of the design challenges, and even constructed the headstock and tailstock assemblies, as well as the first draft of the chuck. Since then, I've made some progress on the construction of the lathe. I also abandoned the original chuck design, and I explored a few designs before landing on something a little bit different. Before we talk about the current state of the project, let's look at the original chuck design. We'll figure out what was wrong with it, look at a couple of things I tried along the way, and then finally, the solution that we've landed on. This is the final revision of the original chuck design, and this was inspired pretty heavily by a design by another YouTuber. Um, his design actually used a timing belt, which was originally what I tried to use in this design, but I found that the timing belt slipped quite a lot. And so I ended up replacing it with a piece of chain, but even then, there are a lot of weak links in this design. The real Achilles heel of this construction is that all of the clamping force that can be imparted by the chuck has to be withstood by every set screw in the design. And there's a lot of mechanical advantage from the outside of the arms or from the outside of the gear drive to try to shear these uh, grub screws right out of here. And yes, I could drill all of these out and replace them with pins, but at a certain point, you have to look at this thing and go, well, this is heavy, it's complex, it's massive, and there's gotta be a simpler way to achieve the same thing with fewer parts that are capable of flying off of it while it's spinning at, say, a couple hundred RPM. So this design was out, I needed to find something simpler. And I found something simpler. In fact, this is too simple. Um, this entire design is printed out of resin on an SLA printer, and it is comprised of five parts. It's eight parts if you count the rubber O-rings. So um, what we have here is a cone that is threaded on the inside, and it threads onto this assembly here. And this assembly has slots in it for each of the chuck teeth. As you can see, I have one installed and each of the chuck teeth has a little rubber O-ring that goes through the tooth and then connects onto this assembly here so that as you press on the tooth, it is theoretically returned by the O-ring. Now, of course, this thing works barely when it's really thoroughly lubed up with silicone lubricant. And even then it's pretty stiff. I can show you in theory how it's supposed to work. If I turn this cone, if you can imagine that this is uh, connected to the shaft, the bore of the lathe with set screws. As you tighten this cone, the cone impinges on our uh, little slanted back of the tooth right here and causes the tooth to move in towards the center of the chuck. Now, this theoretically gives you a huge amount of mechanical advantage because, you know, you've got this thread moving this, so you've got this whole screw working in your favor. One turn is equivalent to a very small amount of movement in this chuck. Unfortunately, it also creates a huge amount of friction between these two bearing surfaces, and it just really doesn't work. You can hear the creaking and the cracking that's happening as I turn it. And uh, ultimately, I mean, I think this was too simple. So I went about adding a little bit of mechanical complexity back into this design to try to salvage the, the working principle. This is my pretty absurd attempt to take the cone chuck design and turn it into something that was actually usable by eliminating the big cone-shaped bearing surface and just replacing it with this flat race that this tiny little bearing rides on. And of course that bearing pushes a lever arm in this uh, four bar mechanism here. And you can see that that swings these chuck teeth from outside to inside. And of course, uh, you know, this works well. If I turn this, um, you can see that I am indeed pushing on that tooth and it's moving towards the center of the chuck. But, uh, you know, this, this has its own problems. Chief amongst them, you know, these parts right here are pretty thin and flimsy. And even if I cut them out of uh, a metal instead of having them 3D printed, 
you know, getting all of this pressed together in a way that's satisfactory uh, just doesn't seem very likely. And this design doesn't even have a spring return built in to these teeth yet. Now, in theory, I could put, you know, a spring across this right here, and that would give me the return that I need. But this was getting um, silly. The solution I came up with was to abandon the three jaw chuck entirely and move to a collet chuck. Now there are limitations to using a collet chuck, but it solves a lot of the problems that we are having with the three jaw chuck. This is an ER32 collet chuck with a 10 centimeter mounting flange that I bought on Amazon for about $40. And this is basically bottom of the barrel for a lathe part like this. Is the accuracy perfect? Is the concentricity perfect? Probably not, it was $40, but I don't think it's really gonna be an issue for the kind of work that we're doing here. The expensive part of using collet chuck is having a set of collets that match all of the tools, or in our case, all of the work pieces that we want to put in the chuck. But in this case, we can actually 3D print all of the collets that we need. This collet is 3D printed on a standard desktop FDM printer out of PLA. It's not particularly hard, it's not particularly heat resistant, but it works perfect and it's basically disposable. If you break it or if you melt the face of it too bad by working too close to it with a torch, you can just toss it and print another one ready to go in an hour or so. We can also design these so that they have a customized inner diameter to hold any sort of tool or workpiece that we want to hold in our lathe. This one is sized to a particular outer diameter of Pyrex tubing that I've been working with. You can see if we take a piece of our tubing and slide it in like this, we can screw down the chuck and now it is stuck in there. And because it's a collet, it is through all the way through the bore. You can put this piece of glass in the front of the headstock here and it'll come out the back of the tailstock, which means that we can connect things like a blow hose to the other end of it. To mount the collet chuck to the bore of the lathe, I 3D printed this adapter out of engineering resin. It simply slides over the shaft of the lathe where it can be secured with set screws, although in this case, I haven't needed to because the fit between these two parts was such a tight interference fit that I don't see any need to actually add any set screws yet. And then the bolt pattern on the flange of the adapter matches the bolt pattern on the chuck. A couple of taps on the face with a dead blow, and I can get the run out on this dialed in well within what we need for our application. You may have also noticed that the lathe is finally on rails. I ended up using much longer rails for the lathe than I had originally designed, mostly because I could. It never hurts to have more space in between the headstock and tailstock, and there's also a possibility that you know, these things might live over here and there could be another machine that lives on the same piece of rail over here somewhere. Who knows? These are very inexpensive linear rail and bearings and you can hear it, but it doesn't actually matter that much. The headstock will be locked in place the whole time and the tailstock will be driven by this ball screw. I also have this unclaimed set of linear bearings in between the headstock and tailstock, which is where the fire carriage is gonna sit. Here inside the headstock, you can see I have a 3D printed pulley that's mounted around the bore of the lathe, just like I designed in CAD. And that's driven by a timing belt down to a smaller pulley on this stepper motor. This stepper motor looks kind of anemic for this design, but honestly, if I need any more juice than this stepper motor can put out, I'm probably doing something wrong. Now, the lathe will run this way, and I've been playing with it this way for a while. I can push this pulley out of alignment with the drive pulley, which puts enough tension on this belt so that it doesn't skip. But ideally, I would have an idler here that would push into the belt and add the tension that we need so that it doesn't skip teeth. If I hold an idler wheel in my hand and press it against this belt while it's running, I can hold the spindle and darn near stall the motor before the belt starts to skip, so I'm not too worried about the belt skipping after final assembly. I don't have a driver or a control board built or even laid out for this yet, so I've been testing it using this little stepper controller driver module that I bought on Amazon. As far as I'm concerned, the proof of concept is basically finished. I just need to replicate what I've done to the headstock onto the tailstock and then finish building the enclosure and the fire carriage and then it'll be ready to go. 
Now, I had intended to actually build a couple of vacuum tubes for this video, and I did start on those devices, but unfortunately, I ran out of oxygen for the torch in the middle of the pinch. There's literally not a worse time that that could happen, and it made me so angry that I'm gonna make sure this problem never happens again. These bags are filled with 13X molecular sieves made of a material called zeolite, and they are going to be the medium in a pressure swing absorption oxygen concentrator, which I plan on building for my next project. If the oxygen concentrator works correctly, I should never have to worry about buying oxygen or refilling oxygen tanks ever again. I can simply separate it from the air that I'm breathing. And the only reason I was able to afford a couple of kilograms of zeolite shipped straight from China is because of the Patreon. At patreon.com slash integrated therm, you can kick me any amount of money per month you want, and you'll get access to the videos up to 24 hours ahead of the time that I post them publicly on YouTube. It's also a great place to get in touch with me and ask questions or make suggestions about projects that we're working on. If you donate $10 a month or more, you can have your name added to the end of every YouTube video, just like the names that you're seeing appear on the screen right now. I know this was a shorter video than usual, and hopefully right now you're looking at some enticing B-roll that I shot while I was working on the next video, hopefully, which is going to be about actually making vacuum tubes. But before I can finish that video, of course, I need my torches up and running again. But if you want a nice step-by-step -step of putting together a vacuum diode in your home shop, I have written that up and taken some nice pictures for Make Magazine, and you can find that in Make Magazine Volume 86, which is out right now. Thanks for hanging around to the end of the video, and I'll see you next time.